from the church. We're only one week away from Christmas Day. Are you guys excited about that? Come on. So we're going to sing a Christmas song called Joy to the World. I know you know it. So why don't you put your hands together and clap with me? Come on. Sing it out. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us We be, God, we 
sing it out with me. Joyful and triumphant, oh come ye, oh come ye to bear. Come and behold. Oh come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh come, let us adore him. Oh come, let us adore him. Oh come, let us.
And my friend showed me four or five verses in the Bible and he said, God answers prayer, you need to pray about this. Two weeks later, she came back to me and told me that she was totally healed from the cancer. <laughs> I went home and I screamed to the creator of the universe saying, what's wrong with me? Why aren't I healed? I just felt the Holy Spirit just stop me in my tracks. And I just started crying out, Jesus, Jesus. He was ready for me whenever I was ready for him. He is dying. He has days to die. And yet he is saying, praise the Lord. I experienced God in the midst of my grief. Hey, Cornerstone, this has been an absolutely remarkable year at Cornerstone. Uh, we've had over 700 decisions for Christ this year already, and we still have Christmas Eve services to go. Harvest Festival, we saw more than 10,000 people on our campus, and a whole bunch who came back the next Sunday to check us out. Uh, we had an incredible marriage series with great attendance, but probably more important than that is we've had 200 people who've been part of the re-engage uh, study afterwards, and marriages that are just getting stronger and healthier all around around our campus. Uh, we, every single weekend, are seeing more and more and more people come here to Cornerstone. Uh, this auditorium fills up uh, multiple times every single weekend with four services. And it's just been incredible what God is doing in this place. Most recently, you and I joined hands together and we raised over $170,000 for the girls' home in Zambia. Man, that's not only gonna buy the home, it's also gonna pay for the staff and the medical needs for those girls, the education, the food, and the clothing for those girls. Guys, it's just been an incredible, incredible time. If that's not enough, uh, we've started the building project. If you walk by, you can see walls going up on the children's building. But that's also probably the one place that we've lost just a little bit of momentum. Ever since August, our giving has been down a little bit. And if you remember, the agreement we made with each other was that we would hold to the budget all year long and then everything that you gave above the budget was gonna go directly into the building program. Unfortunately, for the last few months, we haven't been able to roll very much into the building. So here's what I'm asking. I'm asking if you were part of that original commitment to the building, you began tithing, and if for some reason you've slacked off on that a little bit, would you re-engage? Would you get back on board and help us do that? We surely don't wanna come up short. If you you've never been part of the building program, would you jump in and help us do it? It's an incredible building that's gonna have kids begging their parents to come every single Sunday. And then for everybody who's been giving faithfully, thank you, thank you for doing that. Stay on course with us. We're coming to the end of the year, and end of the year is typically the time we look back on what we've given over the course of the year, and if we're not satisfied with what we've given, we end up trying to catch up with a year-end gift. So that might be the way that you jump in and help us right now so that we can continue just doing the remarkable, remarkable things that God is doing around this place. So would you pray about it? Pray about what you could do to help us finish this year strong, knowing that everything that goes over the budget is going to that brand new building, it's going to the brand new educational spaces for our adults and the expansion of our auditorium. You can give by texting GIVE to 21999, and then we've got a video just highlighting some of the really cool stuff that God's been doing in this place. You're gonna wanna watch it. My kids going to Cornerstone, they, they, they loved it so much and just seeing the excitement on their face, they kept praying for me to come. So I come to Cornerstone and I have felt God's hand more than I ever have in my entire life. Then I started to go to church and I felt like Jesus was like talking to me while I was at church. Everything that I was going through at the time 
is what he was talking about. It's like, there's nobody in the room but me and him. I walked in and I, I heard worship and I remember the moment they were playing How He Loves and I just started crying and I just knew that I wanted that back in my life. I found myself getting closer to God and reading my Bible more. I drove by Cornerstone and uh, I went in, into church and and I gave my life over to him that moment. Right when I walked in, that was probably the best decision I've ever made. I believe that God gives every generation an assignment. And I don't think it's hard to figure out what ours is. When you see your heavenly father working, that is your invitation to join in and say, God, I just wanna be part of it. I wanna do my part in the family. Within the first couple weeks of Cornerstone, I thought, I want to get baptized. I just feel a lot more content and just an indescribable peace with Jesus. I had been having all of this anxiety, all of this grief, and that was the moment where I just decided I was gonna put it all on God and I wasn't gonna carry that anymore. And my life's really never been the same. I'm not lonely anymore. I'm not, uh, I'm not running around angry anymore. And being different around my family, like my wife and kids, and they can notice a difference in me. And that's when it truly hit me. I just knew that Jesus would be there. Life is an opportunity that God gives to us. Life is an opportunity to love, to serve, to honor God and mankind. One of the things we chose to do, we're gonna build a children's building that absolutely has kids begging to bring their families to church. We're gonna have more adult space here than we've ever had before. We are absolutely committed to helping you grow as better parents and as better in your marriages. The two best things you could ever give your child, a mom and dad who love each other and a mom and dad who are chasing Jesus. It is, guys. It's amazing what God is doing in this place. If you're here today for your very first time, you need to know we were praying that you would be here. So you being in these seats is literally an answer to prayer for us. And we just want to say welcome. And uh, we would love to connect with you. And how you can do that is you can text NEW to 21999. We're not gonna bug you. We're just gonna tell you about how to get connected in this place. The other thing that you could do is head out those doors when the service is over. There's a NEW HERE, START HERE booth. You're gonna wanna ask them about next steps because when you start getting ready to say, hey, I wanna know more about this place, I wanna find out for sure if this is where I belong, Next Steps is a class, it happens every week, that's just gonna tell you more about Cornerstone and what we believe and why we do the things we do, and you're gonna be able to figure out if this is home for you or not. The second thing is, Christmas Eve services are like a week and a half away. I mean, they are coming fast. Actually, they're less than that. They're a week away. We want you to be part of what's happening at Christmas Eve in several ways. Number one is this, would you invite somebody? 
all of us probably have someone in our life we're just thinking, boy, if they could figure out God, their life would be wonderfully different. And there's a real good chance that the reason you're in their life is because you're their best chance to figure out who God is. So would you invite them to Christmas Eve services? Have them come with you, sit in the uh, seats with you, and then they're going to hear the story and the wonder of Jesus Christ. And I can't even think of anything more exciting than if you could finish this Christmas season saying, hey, my friend, my co-workers, life has changed because I was brave enough to give an invitation. Second thing is, is that we need some help. There's 10 services. So would you consider serving one or two services, things like greeters and ushers or helping us out with the snow, with the kids? Would you consider serving with us? And you can serve by simply texting Christmas to 21999. There's a place there you can say, I'll serve. Because maybe you're coming on Sunday, you could serve a little bit on Saturday or vice versa. And then finally, if you call Cornerstone home, would you consider coming on the Saturday services versus the Sunday services? Because here's what we know. Uh, tons and tons and tons of guests are going to fill this room up all day Sunday. And if we all come on Sunday, then there's not going to be enough seats. And people are going to be turned away and they're going to have a bad experience. So one of the ways you can navigate this is, again, text the word Christmas to 21999, and you can click on the service that you're going to attend. When you click on it, it'll tell you if there's still seats available or not, okay? And then we all get to have an incredible Christmas together. Year-end giving. We've been talking to you about, hey, sometimes we get to the end of the year, things have come up. We didn't give what we hoped to give. And there's a chance at year end we go, oh, I'm gonna make that up. I'm gonna catch up with where I wanted to be. Well, it's two weeks till end of year. So we just want to encourage you. What a great time to give a Christmas gift to Jesus by giving at year end giving. And you can give again by texting give to 21999. All right, budget time. Brand new year, that means budget. If you'll look in your seat back, you're gonna see a card that looks like this. And it's kind of walking you through the budget for this next year. If you remember, we're in a place where we've said, hey, we'll approve the budget, we'll hold to the budget, then everything you guys give above the budget immediately goes to the building. You and I, we're all struggling with this thing called inflation right now. So your staff went, as we went into budget, this, I mean, we worked, like we made every nickel cry as we put the budget together. And so we've come back this year and we're proposing a 6% increase from last year's budget. Now here's the thing I want you to think about when you do that. I guarantee your life has increased by more than 6%. You can't go to the gas pump and pay only 6% more than you did last year. And as we do church, that's true here too. Every ba bag of goldfish crackers for the kids costs more than it did last year. I'm absolutely proud of your staff that we worked so hard that we could come to you this year and only propose a 6% increase in our budget. But this is here for you to look at. On the back side, there's a place for you to say, hey, I agree, I think this is a good thing, I'm in, I accept it. Or you can say, boy, those guys must be greedy. They went 6% up, and you can say, I reject it. Uh, and then when you get ready to leave, uh, there's baskets at the back, you'll drop that in the basket. You're gonna let us know how you feel about that. Uh, last thing, you and I have a special speaker uh, today. He's a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, I'm guessing in your life, you've got people who are friends that sometimes you're apart for a while, but when you get back together, it's like not a moment has passed and you instantly reconnect. And that's what Brad and Sarah are to Lisa and to me. Brad has uh, launched and built an amazing church in Texas. And beyond that, he's been part of starting 14 other churches in Texas. He's just a remarkable catalytic leader. And I'm just gonna ask you to join me in welcoming Brad Wilkerson to the stage.
What's up, Cornerstone? Great to see all of you. Okay, I've been told that you're the best service of the weekend. I've been told that you're the best service of the weekend. Yeah, there we go. There we go. You're the best because you're the last one. So good to see you guys this weekend. It's an honor and a privilege to be at Cornerstone. And we bring you greetings from the great nation of Texas. <laughs> the home of the soon-to-be Super Bowl champion, Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> And I hope it's not too soon, but the current reigning World Series champions, the Texas Rangers, I'm sorry, we waited a long time to say that. It's so good to be here. We love Pastor Lynn and Lisa. Come on, let's just give some honor where honor is due to your pastor and his wife. Cornerstone has had a huge impact all over the world. You just saw that in the video but it's had a huge impact in our world personally. And my wife, Sarah, who's on the front row and I, are forever grateful for the investment of Cornerstone and Pastor Lynn and Lisa. Just a few weeks ago, 24 staff members from our church were sitting right here at the S2 conference and God moved in this room and it's just an honor to be here. I told Lynn backstage, I said, I'm preaching on a stage where giants have stood and it's amazing to be in this room. Have you ever noticed, have you ever looked around have you ever tuned into the fact that uh, in America, Christmas and movies go together like Forrest and Jenny? Like peas and carrots. Like, I don't know about your house, dudes, but at my house, it's October 1. The television has not left the Hallmark Channel. It's just rerun after rerun of the same story, just different actors in a different title. Christmas and movies go together. Have you ever wondered where that started and why that is? Well, if you do the research and you go back a few years in our nation's history, you'll find that this all began in the World War II era. Now, you and I, we live on the other side of World War II. We've read the history books. We know we won the war. But the people that were in the throes of that season of life, they did not know. Winning was not a foregone conclusion. And so anxiety was at an all-time high and encouragement was at an all-time low. And people needed hope. And they found that hope in Christmas. Hollywood seized an opportunity and they capitalized on it and they cranked out classic movies that are still classics today. And the American public would go to a theater for a 90-minute escape complete with popcorn only to find that at the end of the day they had to leave the theater when the movie ended and the hero on the screen actually didn't save the world. Movies that came out during that era were movies like Miracle on 34th Street, White Christmas, Christmas in Connecticut, Holiday Inn, but the one that is our family's favorite, the one we watch every Christmas day, every year, is called It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life is a classic movie. It is 77 years old, and it still is relevant and has an impact today. Why is that? Well, it's a great story, is it not? I mean, it's a brilliant plot line to write a screenplay about a guy who sees what life would have been like if he had not been born. It's also a great movie because Jimmy Stewart's in it. And I know a lot of you have no idea who that is. Just Google it. But it's really not a great movie because, because, because of Jimmy Stewart or the plot line. It's a great movie because of the director. The director of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, his name is Frank Capra. And Frank Capra's story is a rags to riches story. He was a five-year-old boy when his family immigrated from Italy to the United States. He writes in his biography that when they pulled into New York Harbor, they stood on the top deck of the ship and his father pointed at the Statue of Liberty and said, son, that's the greatest light since the Star of Bethlehem. His story is amazing. He worked hard, he got an education, he became an engineer and eventually was exposed to the film industry and made cheap movies. In an interview that he gave, he stated this about his movies. He said, my films must let every man, woman, and child know that God loves them and I love them too. Oh, that we would have some directors in Hollywood like that today. My movies need to let people know that God loves them and I love them too. So I think It's a Wonderful Life is a great classic movie because of Frank and his directing of it. But at the end of the day, watch this, it's still a movie. It's fiction. 
and George Bailey doesn't save the world. But today we're going to talk about the real classic Christmas movie, the real story of Christmas, the story of how God put on human flesh and became one of us so that we could become like him. And that film and that story and that screenplay has a director as well. And so we're going to answer the question today, who was directing the real Christmas story 2,000 years ago? And here's, here's the question for all of us today. Is he still directing the epic of us in Chandler, Arizona, in Prosper, Texas, or wherever you've come from or you're watching from today? The answer to that question is found in the book of Luke. And I would encourage you to turn in the book of Luke to Luke chapter 1. And if Pastor Lynn was here, he would say, if you go to the back of your Bible... And turn to your left, a few pages, you'll find the book of Luke. I watch Pastor Lynn every week. He's my favorite preacher in all of the planet Earth. You guys are blessed. Luke is writing about Mary and the detailed interaction she has with the angel Gabriel. And he picks up in verse 26, and Luke says, God sent the angel Gabriel to a virgin named Mary. Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. And you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. In other words, Mary, you're going to give birth to a son, and he actually is the hero that will save the world. Now watch this. Watch the next thing, the the interaction with the angel and Mary have. Mary says to the angel, she asked him a question, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, and meet the director of the Christmas saga, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Mary asked a question, how could this be possible? I am a virgin. Now, now, it's a great question, is it not? She's asking a question that she has every right to ask. How is it biologically possible for this to be when I've never known a man intimately? And every woman in this room, you would ask the same question. And the only answer she gets from Gabriel to her question about the biological fact that this cannot happen if it's up to man, but everything is possible with God, the, the, the explanation that Gabriel gives her is one word overshadow. The Holy Spirit, Mary, will overshadow you. Now, when we read that, we don't quite understand it the way Mary would have understood it. But you have to understand, Mary is Jewish. So she is schooled in the Jewish religious practices. She knows what it's like to go to the synagogue. She knows how to dot the I's and cross the T's in the Jewish faith. And so when she hears the word overshadow, she knows what that means. It's a word called Shekinah. It's an Old Testament word that stands for the Shekinah glory of God. So when the angel said the Holy Spirit will come over you and overshadow you, she understood that the very presence and the brilliance of God was the one that would be doing the immaculate conception. Go with, back with me a few thousand years before Mary. You remember a guy named Moses. He was to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, and in that journey to the promised land, he tells God, I want to see you. I want to see the face of God. How many of you are looking forward to seeing God someday? Come on. It's going to be awesome. And, and he says, I want to see you. And God says, hey, Moses, no man can look on me and live. That's how much my glory is. You can't even look on me and live. But, but Moses insists, I want to see you. And so God says, here's what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to put you in a crevice or a cleft of a rock. And I'm going to pass by you. And when I pass by you, I'm going to shield your eyes. And then when I get past you, I'll remove the shield. And you can see the backside of my glory. That's all you can handle. The Bible records that after that high speed pass by by God, Moses came down the mountain. And when the children of Israel saw Moses, they couldn't even look at him because he glowed with the glory of God from just the backside of God. This is the Shekinah glory that is overpowering Mary. It's the same presence and glory of God that would manifest itself and himself on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the temple. She knows exactly what Gabriel is saying. The Holy Spirit is directing the brilliance and the presence of Almighty God who is putting the seed of a son in her that has come literally from heaven. 
This is why Jesus stands out from every other human being that's ever lived. He's the only one that has ever been virgin born. No one before him and no one since him. And beyond that, it is so important that you understand that Mary was a virgin because, ladies, you've known this, you've known this for decades, and it didn't take you five minutes to know it after your first child was born. The sin nature has been passed down from the Father. Ladies, that's where you say amen. (laughs) The sin nature has been passed down from the Father. You see, Eve was deceived, but Adam chose to sin. And so when Jesus came, he was born of an earthly mother, but a heavenly father. And so watch this, Jesus in his very being can touch the the shoulder of the father with one hand and you and I's shoulder with the other hand and he can bring us back together. And by the way, when they hung him on the cross, it looked just like this. That's how the Holy Spirit was directing the story of Christmas. But the question is, is he still directing epics today in Chandler? Is he still wanting to direct the epic of you And the answer is a resounding yes. And if it's true that he wants to direct your life and my life, then we have to ask, what is his playbook? What is his protocol? And how does he do it? Three quick things this morning. If you take notes, write these down. By the way, 75% of people who take notes in church have a better chance of getting into heaven than those who don't. So write these things down. I just made that up. All right. The first one is this. This is the last service. You have no idea what you're going to get, right? The Holy Spirit lives inside of God's children. The Holy Spirit is directing your life as a follower of God because he lives inside you. When you say yes to Jesus, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit indwells your life. You know what that means? If you are a child of the King, if you're a son or daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that God is with you on the 202. It means God is with you in line at Fry's. It means God is with you when you're on the stands and the kids are on the field to play. God is with you. It also means this, that the God that's going to go with Sarah and I when we get on a plane today to go home is the same God that's going to stay here in Arizona with you. Follow me for a minute. Jesus Jesus in John 13, 14, 15, and 16 is having an intimate conversation with his disciples, and he's telling them all kinds of truth bombs about what's coming in their life and what's coming in his life. The cross is coming into full view, and he's, he's making statements like, like I'm going to go away, and, and they're like, well, tell us where you're going. And he says, well, I'm going to the Father, and they's like, they're like, we don't know the way. And he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man gets to the Father except through me, and he's talking about all these things, and then they start saying, why would you want to go away? And he says, listen, and it's better that I go away because if I go away, I'm going to send you what, what, what? The comforter. In fact, it's in John chapter 14, verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit. See how that's capitalized? That means the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Next verse, the Spirit of truth, you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. The same God who goes with us today stays with you here today. See, God doesn't just move in this place. He moves in every one of our places. This is why Jesus said, it's better that I go away, because while Jesus was 100% God, he was also 100% man, and he could only be in one place at one time. But now God is at all places at all the time. Come on, that's awesome. He's in all places all the time. And if you don't get anything else out of the message today, don't miss this. Everything Jesus was in his world, the Holy Spirit is now in our world. See, sometimes the Holy Spirit wigs people out. If you're like me, you grew up independent, fundamental, King James only. Women couldn't wear pants to church Baptist. And we never talked about the Holy Spirit because he was like crazy cousin Eddie. We just didn't go there. We love God the Father. We love God the Son. But, man, we, just, we thought if we were charismatic, we might turn into crazy-matic. Come on. But the Holy Spirit is just as much God as God the Father and God the, Holy, or God the Son. And he's with you, and he's with me, and he goes with us. And, and people are like, well, man, I wish I could have 10 minutes with Jesus. If I could just have 10 minutes with Jesus of just uninterrupted uh, conversation, I'd tell him about all my struggles. I'd tell him about my wayward child. I'd tell him about my marriage and the troubles in my marriage. Listen, you do have the Holy Spirit with you. When you lay in bed at night and you can't sleep because of the stress of work, because that you have more month than you have money, the Holy Spirit is right there sitting by your bedside. He's with you. He lives in us. 
There's a second playbook, there's a second protocol to how he writes our epic, and it's this. He reveals to us the deep, mysterious truths about God and life. (laughs) How many of you know that as much as you try to know God, you never fully quite understand and know God? By the way, if you could fully comprehend God and understand God, you would be God. If you haven't looked in the mirror lately, let me help you. You're not God, and neither am I. And I don't want a God that I can fully understand. I I want a God that there there are some things that I just have to trust in and step out in faith and follow in. Mysterious, deep truths about God and life. Jesus talking to the disciples again in John 16, 13, he says, when the Spirit, notice that's capitalized again, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Listen to me. There are some things about God that you will never understand in your own physical five senses. And you have to be comfortable with that. Because this is how the Holy Spirit is directing your life. Don't miss this. You're playing checkers. God's playing chess. He's five moves ahead of you. He knows the plans that he has for you, says the Lord. And he's working all things out for your good. Paul's writing to the Corinthians about this very, this very thing of the deep truths of God. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit, capital S, for his Spirit, capital S, searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. Now look at verse 14 because you guys know people just like this. I have people in my life just like this. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Have you ever had somebody look at you when you tell them what God's telling you and they say that makes absolutely no sense? It doesn't make sense to them because they're not connected to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit reveals the deep secrets and the deep truths of God to us. The things that we can never fully understand without Him. It's God, watch this, it's God revealing God to those who aren't God. Isn't that cool? The Holy Spirit, He speaks to us through God's Word. That's why we read God's Word every day, but watch this. He also speaks to us in ways that are mysterious that always line up with the principles of God's word. I I call them God winks. There's times when you have a God wink in your life. And it's like there's there's only one explanation for this, the Holy Spirit. So our church that I pastor in Texas, it's a 16 year old church. For 12 of those 16 years, we met in a middle school setting up and tearing down over 550 weekends of doing that. We started trying to buy a piece of property to eventually build a building. We started that process in 2013. We found a piece of property that we thought God would want for us to have for his church in Prosper, Rock Creek, the church I pastor. And so we had started having conversations with the people who owned the land. And and, and when we asked them, how much do you want for this 30 acres, the number they dropped on us made our jaws drop completely. We're like, we can't afford that. We only have 550 members in our church. How are we going to afford that? So we went to praying about it. God, make this possible. You can do the impossible, so we're going to press into you. We're going to ask you to provide. If you've told us to go there, you make it happen. So we started having negotiations, not just with the Holy Spirit, but with the landowners, And we're negotiating with this family. Their last name is the Warrens. And it takes eight months to finally get to a place where we believe we can move forward. I mean, I look back on it now and I'm like, 2.25 million for 30 acres? That's silly to be afraid of that because now the land's worth over 6 million. And so we finally get to a term that we can both agree upon and our board votes to buy the land on these terms and they agree to sell us to the land on these terms. And so lawyers go to work because that's what lawyers do. And they drop a contract, and and the Warren's lawyers give it a thumbs up, and our lawyers for the church give it a thumbs up. It's a go. Sign the contract. Well, Johnny and Kathy Warren sign it in a heartbeat. Wouldn't you? They're going to be multimillionaires overnight. But it's lacking one signature. It needs 
my signature, and I won't sign it. I'm scared to death. I, 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 I'm like, God, I've never, this is big, God. Have, have you seen how many zeros are at the end of this number? And I won't sign it. Chairman of our board's like, bro, sign the contract. I'm like, you sign it. No, you sign it. I'm like, dude, this scares me. I'm not so sure. What if God doesn't come through? What if God, what if God? And he says, what if God does come through? Sign the contract. It sat on my desk for three weeks and I wouldn't sign it. It was during the Easter season that all this was going on and we did an Easter egg hunt on Palm Sunday after church at the football field at the school we were meeting in. We were so hip back then, we dropped these eggs from a helicopter, right? Drop all these eggs and we got these age groups of kids coming out there hunting eggs. And my job that day was to announce the age groups of the kids to come out onto the field because you don't want fifth graders pummeling kindergartners. And so I'm up there going, all right, now get ready. Five-minute call for the first graders. Five-minute call for the first graders. And they actually asked me to do that because it kept me out of the way and I didn't bother people through the day. I'm standing there between the gap of the first graders and the second graders just kind of minding my own business. Hey, how you doing? Hey, you got, you got nice, nice basket there. You know, just, just being friendly to people. And here she comes. This lady making a beeline to me who I've never seen before. And the first thing I notice is she has crazy eyes. Have you ever met someone with crazy eyes? Yeah, that's the first sign that they're loco, is that they got crazy eyes. And she's coming towards me, and I'm like, I'm looking for the security team. I'm pulling my earlobe. That's the signal. Save me, save me. And she comes up to me, and she says, hey, are you the pastor? And I said, it depends. <laughs> what do you want, Right. No, I said, yeah, I'm the pastor. She said, hey, uh, my name is so-and-so, and, and I'm here with my kids because a couple in your church invited us to come to this big event. Thanks for having it. It's great. We don't go to your church. We live about 40 miles south of you, but, but, but this family said it would be a lot of fun, and, and I barely know the family that she's talking about because they don't come very often, and listen, that family has no idea we're buying this land. And so in this conversation between first graders and second graders, this lady says to me, I have a word from the Lord for you. And immediately I'm thinking, do, 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 do. She's crazy. I knew it. She cray cray. She says, I have a word from the Lord for you. Can I, can I share it with you? <laughs> I thought in that moment, what am I going to answer? And finally I said, hey, if you got something from God, I'm all ears. And here's what she says to me. She says, God wants you to know that whatever you're fearing, do not fear it. Okay, well, that's generic. Anybody can say that. And then she drops this bomb. God wants you to know that where you're afraid to go, he's already there waiting on you. <laughs> she turned around and walked away. I said, what, what, what you got anything else? <laughs> Like, like, anything else? You know the lottery numbers? Anything else, right? She walked away. What do you think I did at the end of that day? I signed that contract. I delivered that to that Warren family. We bought that land. Now we have a building on that land, and 2,500 people will worship on that property this weekend, and 264 people were baptized in that building this calendar year. I think she was right. God was there already waiting on me. And sometimes, watch, sometimes we miss the God winks because we're too busy doing this. And you're like, well, pastor, I'm, a, I'm on my version app. Stop it. Come on. We're too busy sometimes that we miss God's winks in our lives. But I've saved the best one for last. How does the Holy Spirit direct our lives today? It's simply this, the Holy Spirit guarantees everything God has promised us. Everything God has promised us as his children, the Holy Spirit guarantees that promise. Let me show you something in Ephesians. This is so cool. Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, people just like you and I. And he says these words in Ephesians 4.30. The Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There's a reason why sealed is in all caps because that is a unique word that Paul is using to get his point across to them and to us. You see, he's referring to the Roman Empire who's in control of pretty much the entire world at this time and the Romans loved to seal things. 
They loved to stamp the Roman seal on things, either the Roman Empire seal or the seal of Caesar. See, see, when they would put a seal on something, it would certify it. It was certified that what they say is in there is in there. You go to the marketplace and they are selling you a bag of grain that weighs 20 pounds and it has a Roman seal on it. It's saying that we guarantee that what's in there is 20 pounds. Hey, listen, when Jesus died on a cross, they took him off the cross, they put him in a borrowed tomb, they rolled a stone over the opening of that tomb and then they stamped, what'd they stamp on it? A rubber seal, a seal of the Roman Empire. And the Bible says that on that third day, on that resurrection morning, he arose and the stone was rolled away, but the seal was broken. But it was certifying that Jesus of Nazareth was in that tomb. Now listen, when you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, it certifies that what God says is in you is in you. And so when people come against you and tell you, oh, you can't be a child of God, I know what you used to be. No, 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 you say what's in me is in me and I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit because he's in me. When you feel guilty and you have guilt feelings and and, and the enemy tries to make you feel guilty of what you used to be, you remind him of who he is and you say, no, 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 what's in me is in me. I've been certified by the seal of the Holy Spirit. But there's a second point to the seal. The Romans would seal stuff because it meant it was protected. This will preach, folks. It meant that if you mess with that seal, If you break that seal, if you jack with that seal, you're messing with the entire Roman army. And when you have the seal of the Holy Spirit on your life, when the hot breath of the devil comes against you, he is messing with the entire armies of heaven because the Holy Spirit's seal is on you. He'll say, hey, you're a loser. And you say, no, 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 no. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. The seal of the Holy Spirit's on me, and you're messing with the entire army of heaven. But the third one is the best one, and don't get ahead of me here. Let me preach it, okay? Because some of you know exactly where I'm going. That, That seal meant also that you were marked for pickup. You were marked for pickup. Now, follow with me. Roman leaders and Roman emperors would never go shopping for themselves, They would never run down to Home Depot and buy their own lumber. They would send an agent as their buying or purchasing agent to buy the things they needed. And many a times the agent would purchase the stuff but couldn't get it all the way back to the emperor or the leader. And so they would stamp it with a Roman seal that meant it belonged to that leader or that emperor. And they would be back someday to get what was marked for pickup. Whoa, this is good. I'm writing this sermon the other day, and I'm writing this sermon in Starbucks. Now, I'm not a big Starbucks fan. I like more the mom and pop coffee shops, but the location I was at that day, I couldn't find one of those, so I end up in Starbucks. And I write a lot of sermons in coffee shops because my staff isn't there. And when I'm around staff, they wanna talk and they wanna hang out. So I have to find places to write. So I've got my AirPods in my ear. I'm listening to worship music and I'm writing this and and I'm writing this point about Mark for pickup. And as I'm writing this, I I notice people keep coming into Starbucks, walking up to a counter and taking drinks out of the store without paying for them. I'm like, what's going on? I mean, they just walk right in, look, find a drink, grab it and leave. I'm like, "They're, they're robbing Starbucks. They're stealing people's drinks. And so I go up to the counter And I talked to the little barista behind the counter. I said, people are stealing the drinks. They didn't pay for them. And she goes, oh, no, 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 no. You you can order coffee on an app. And you pay for it with your phone. And we put the owner's name on the cup. And so when they come in, they're looking for their name because it's marked for their pickup. And they just take it with them. See, See, I still order coffee by talking to the person behind the counter. And using cash to pay, I mean, and it's, it, I know it's a unique idea. Listen, listen, you know what you and I are? We're cups on a counter at Starbucks. And we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And someday God the Father on his calendar is gonna look at God the Son. And he's gonna say, son, it's time. It's time to go and get those who have the seal of the Holy Spirit on. It's time to go to Starbucks and find our drinks. It's time, son. 
And the Bible says that that Jesus is going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord because we're marked for pickup. Come on, folks. That's the best news of today. I was thinking backstage before we had this service, boy, it'd be really good if he would come before Christmas Eve. I wouldn't have to preach five times and Lynn wouldn't have to preach ten. But I'm ready. I'm ready whenever he calls. And I'm marked for pickup because I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. My mom was a single mom until I was eight. My dad left when I was three. So for five years, my mom did her best to raise me, work two jobs, date again, all that stuff. My mom made some really, really poor decisions in that window of time between the age of three and eight in my life. And at the age of six, my mom thought it would be really wise to take me to see a movie in 1970, 1975. She thought she'd take me to a movie that would be a good family feature, but I ended up being afraid to get in the water for several months after we saw that movie. And if you were raised in the 70s, you know what I'm talking about. Duh, duh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got the t-shirt and everything. It's retro now. It's a cult classic, Jaws. You know, Jaws was up for the Academy Award for Picture of the Year in 1976. What kind of culture are we? That the picture of the year would be about a shark eating people. It only lost to another movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. What a year. If I were to ask you today, who was the director? Who was the director of Jaws? Most of you that know any history about the movie, you would say Steven Spielberg. And you would be partly right because he did direct the movie, but he wasn't the original director. The original director of the movie that was hired by the producer was a guy named Dick Richards. Now think about that for a minute. His parents named him Richard Richards. Dick Richards was the original director. And shortly after they started making the movie, the producer fired him and he hired Steven Spielberg. He fired Dick Richards, watch this, because he kept referring to the shark as a whale. It's like, man, if you're going to make the movie, you got to call the shark the shark, not the whale. And, of course, Steven Spielberg made the movie, and the rest is history. Why am I telling you that? Everybody lean in and tune in as we get ready to close. Some of you need to fire the director in your life. Some of you have people in your life that are directing your life that are calling you a whale when God is calling you a shark. You got friends that you need to fire that are wanting to direct your life. You have some family members maybe. I mean, some of you right now, you've got anxiety about family members who are coming to town next weekend that want to direct your life. Hey, watch this. Some of your lives are directed by a social media feed of likes or dislikes. Coworkers, a boss, a classmate. But here's the biggest one. Listen, some of you are directing your own life and you need to fire your director. And you need to hire the Holy Spirit. Rehire him to direct your life. You'd be amazed at what God could do with little unknown you. Every time I walk out on a stage, I'm amazed that God would use me. A kid that had absolutely no business being in ministry. No business preaching and and representing God. Yet, Yet the... Holy Spirit has been directing this the entire time. Come on. Let the Holy Spirit be the director of your life. He's still writing epics today. And he he wants to write yours. Father God, we just thank you so much for the weekend here. Oh, you've you've just been so good in this room. But we know that you're going to leave this room because you go with all of us. And as we go back to Texas, Lord, I pray you'd bless Rock Creek like never before, specifically Christmas Eve services. And I pray that you'd bless Cornerstone like never before. Lord, I pray that you'd pour out a blessing on them. I pray that this would be the best, best Christmas Eve they've ever experienced. There would be more people come to Christ than ever before. 
God, I pray that we would surrender our lives and let you be the director. That we'd even fire ourselves if we are directing our lives. Right now in this room as I'm praying, maybe the Holy Spirit is just working in your heart and in your mind. Bringing to your mind or to your heart someone you need to maybe have a difficult conversation with. Someone that you need to quit allowing to direct your life. God's still writing epics today. Let him write yours. God, again, thanks for being good to us. Thanks for loving us and sending Jesus for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, some of us today need to fire a director. And if that's you and you feel like, hey, I need someone to talk to, I need someone to pray with me, we've got people, they'll meet you here at the front. Uh, You can take your ballots, drop them off as you head to the back door. And we will see you Christmas Eve with a friend.